There's a lot of misinformation and disinformation out there about the concept of a UBI, otherwise known as a basic income or unconditional basic income or universal basic income. So this is a video to uh, better inform people about just how this concept works. Who am I? Uh, I am Scott Santons. I am the founder and president of the Income Support All Foundation, the editor of Basic Income Today. I've been a writer and UBI advocate since 2013. Um, I have advised on basic income policy, and I've been living with a crowdfunded monthly basic income floor since 2015, and I'm the author of Let There Be Money. So first of all, uh, let's go through what actually uh, meets the, the definition of a basic income. So basic income is a periodic cash payment that is unconditionally delivered to all on an in individual basis without means test or work requirement. And so the five characteristics of basic income are that it's cash and that it's unconditional, as in there's no work requirements. Uh, it's universal. Everybody gets it rich or poor. It's uh, provided to individuals instead of just the household level. And it is periodic. So instead of just being like a one-time amount of money, it is monthly, weekly, quarterly. Um, it just needs to be something you can depend on. So basic income two, everyone receives this as a floor. But then also some amount of taxes would be paid um, additionally to the basic income in the form of new taxes or new tax reforms. They could be income taxes, they could be consumption taxes. Um, but the what, what matters is the net result. So there is a point, depending at any basic income design, where someone is paying in new taxes um, the same amount as they're receiving in the basic income. So they are no better or worse off um, in regards to their income. And then below that amount, uh, people would be net recipients of the basic income after taxes. And then above that line, people would be net payers uh, of taxes despite the basic income. So that's important to understand for uh, the cost of basic income. The cost of basic income is not just the amount of basic income multiplied by the total number of recipients. It is the net cost, which is the difference between the basic income and someone's uh, the amount of new tax that someone's paying uh, across the entire population. So the way that works out, just depending on design, is uh, it's usually somewhere around like a third of the uh, gross cost is the net cost of basic income. And that net cost is what the actual cost is. So what makes basic income so different than welfare and just traditional benefits um, as we know them? So as an example um, of just how important universality is, is if you take a look at all these existing programs, like take, for example, SNAP. SNAP, otherwise known as food stamps, uh, reaches two or three people in poverty. And it lasts for three months, uh, unless you uh, have kids. And uh, it can only be used on approved foods. So there's a lot of things that you can't use uh, with SNAP, even food. So like one well, example is you can't use it on hot prepared meals, uh, but you can like buy dried beans with it and make a dish out of that. But what you can't do is like buy pre-prepared like red beans and rice or something. And the difference between, of course, that and UBI is that all of those people would receive the basic income and it would never expire and it could be used on anything. Another example, if you look at uh, TANF, TANF is the uh, 
United States cash welfare program. It reaches about one of five people in poverty on average. Uh, it's only for families. It's not for single adults. And it's a cash grant that goes state by state. So there's a lot of variety uh, within each state. Like one of the worst examples, uh, since I used to live in Louisiana, um, the the coverage rate there was uh, four families out of every 100 families in poverty uh, actually received this. So it's like a 96% exclusion rate there. And of course, some states are, are much better than others. Uh, but on average, one out of five uh, people in the country uh, living under the poverty line receive that assistance. And it's also temporary as well. And that's actually, there's a lifetime limit on that too. So you can only ever get that for a total of five years. UBI reaches five out of five people in poverty. It's permanent and it's equal for everyone, regardless of what state that you're living in. Disability is another example that reaches one out of five people with a disability. And it often takes two years on average to uh, successfully qualify for it. And UBI would reach five out of five people with a disability. And of course, it would automatically begin at birth. So that's not to say that, uh, that there would not be a disability program uh, with a UBI. Uh, but it is saying that you would make sure that every single person with a disability would receive a basic income at the bare minimum. And then you could still have a disability program with full knowledge of the fact that, again, one out of five people with a disability would receive that boost and four to five wouldn't. But at least they all would get that same basic income floor that uh, the rest of us did. Another example is with unemployment that reaches one out of four unemployed people. And of course, it stops with paid work. So this is literally paying people to stay unemployed. And basic income remains with employment. So it's not money to do nothing. It's money to do anything. And of course, it reaches four to five, four to four unemployed people. And of course, continues with work of any kind, including unpaid work. So hopefully everyone understands that the existing safety net has many holes and often more people fall through the safety net than are actually caught by it. That's a summary of some of the observed effects of UBI. There's actually quite a lot of evidence from pilots over um, you know, many years. And I've compiled this, this summary of the various uh, uh, findings. So first of all, this is a very robust finding that there's no significant reduction in labor supply. This was a uh, meta-analysis of 38 studies. Uh, so just over and over and over again, there is just no significant reduction in work. And that is usually one of uh, the main concerns people have about basic income. And we just already know that that is not um, based in the evidence. Uh, another common finding is that Self-employment often increases quite a bit. Uh, in the Namibia UBI pilot, it went up 301%. And uh, in Alaska, that's an example of a place where uh, part-time employment increased 17% and with no decrease in full-time employment. A lot of people don't know that UBI uh, has existed in Alaska uh, since 1982. And among many of these findings, uh, we've learned this stuff from Alaska. Uh, another people, another uh, concern people have is that people will use their basic income on drugs. And uh, another very large uh, Bennett analysis of many studies have found that there is no increase in drug use with unconditional cash transfers. 
and that often uh, a slight decrease is observed overall. Uh, new mothers tend to extend their maternity leaves. So uh, when you, a lot of these pilots, if they do see a, a significant impact uh, in work reduction, that it's not actually like people are working less in the actual sense of the word of work. It's that, you know, maybe they decided to focus on unpaid care work instead of wage labor. And that's especially true when it comes to uh, new mothers. Also, birth weights uh, tend to improve due to better maternal nutrition. So since uh, pregnant mothers are able to um, eat better during their pregnancies, that the children are born healthier, and that actually uh, tends to have positive consequences throughout the, the entire life of uh, that child as they grow up. Uh, graduation rates and educational outcomes tend to improve, and uh, hospitalization rates decline, so people get healthier. They uh, get physically and mentally healthier, um, usually because they eat better as one thing, and there's just less stress. Uh, and in general, that just tends to mean that they require uh, less medical care because they're just healthier. Uh, crime also generally tends to go down, especially in saturation experiments where an entire community receives the basic income. Um, in the Canada's pilot in the 1970s, overall crime went down 15%. And in the Namibia pilot, uh, it went down 42%. And also the Namibia pilot, it went down uh, or a specific crime went down 95%. And that was uh, like the illegal hunting of uh, endangered animals. I think that shows that there are definitely crimes of desperation that people would definitely not do, but they feel that they have no choice but to do it. And if they have a basic income floor, then they're able to completely avoid doing that because they feel that they no longer have to. Uh, domestic violence also tends to decrease. In the Canadian pilot, it went down 37%. And in Kenya's pilot, it went down 51%. And another result from the Alaska dividend is uh, decreased child abuse. For every $1,000 the, of the dividend, it goes down 10%. Uh, one of my favorite findings that I think is really exciting is that uh, trust increases. And this is something that the Finland pilot found, that the increase in politicians, or trust in politicians increased 13%, and uh, trust increased 6% in other people in the, you know, the entire community at large. You can explain that as just basic income being trust. So if the default is trust and you feel trusted by uh, the government by default, then, and by virtue, society is trusting you with a basic income, then I feel you're more likely to trust the government and trust society at large for having trusted you first. Another impact is that home ownership rates increase. This was uh, found in the 70s pilots and uh, that can increase from 17% to 26%. So we can expect that with basic income, there would just be a lot fewer renters and a lot more homeowners. And there's a lot of people out there that would much prefer to own their home and pay a mortgage uh, instead of pay rent. And uh, basic income would increase that ability. Uh, food security, of course, increases as does a uh, consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables. That's a pretty common finding too. Um, now there's, it's, it can be pretty expensive to eat healthier. Uh, it's just easier to buy processed foods and, um, you know, just microwave stuff. Uh, uh, you know, people are busy. And, uh, so if you have just a little bit more time, 
uh, besides just a little bit more money, then it's just easier to uh, spend a little bit more time cooking and being able to afford uh, healthier ingredients. And that's something that people actually like doing. Uh, often homelessness and uh, recidivism go down. Uh, some of the more uh, exciting pilots recently, as in uh, like the Denver pilot focused on homelessness, uh, one of the findings was that the, at the six month mark, uh, at the halfway point, those receiving $1,000 per month, 0% uh, of them were still reporting, spending time out on the, on the streets at night. And um, another one of the pilots focused on recidivism um, found that the one year recidivism rate was 0%. And of course that's just unheard of. Recidivism in, in the US is uh, extremely high. Uh, I believe the recidivism rate average uh, for one year is about uh, a third of people will end up back in prison uh, within that first year. So very exciting to have like zero percent. And uh, another general finding is that savings go up and debts go down. People, when provided this basic income, they uh, if they have debts and loans and stuff, then they prefer to pay that down. And they also prefer to build up savings. So uh, people find themselves much more able to handle any kind of emergency expense um, than they otherwise would. And again, they, you know, they don't waste it. They're actually uh, spending this quite wisely. Here's a list of sources. Uh, I did mention some of these uh, in the previous slide. And uh, there's just so much to learn from all of these. Uh, so again, Alaska's annual permanent fund dividend has existed since 1982. Uh, there's been a lot of studies to uh, to learn what the impacts of that ha have been and continue to be. Then there was the uh, American income maintenance experiments in the 70s. This was back when Nixon proposed a uh, version of basic income that would have been for families uh, called the Family Assistance Plan. And uh, he proposed that in 1969, and it uh, would have, uh, it passed the House uh, twice in the early 70s, and it never made it through the Senate uh, each of the two times that it passed in the House. Uh, but as part of that, uh, there were multiple experiments around the country in uh, New Jersey, North Carolina, and Seattle, Denver, um, multiple places. Then there was the uh, uh, Canada's Mincom experiment in Manitoba in the 1970s as well. That was 74 through 79. Uh, what was very interesting about Delphine was that it was a uh, saturation experiment. So it was like the, the entire town uh, essentially eliminated poverty for that time period. Then there were uh, universal basic income pilots in Namibia and India. Namibia's pilot uh, went from 2008 to 2009, and uh, India's went from 2011 uh, to 2012. Those were both fully universal pilots where uh, in Namibia, the entire village got it. Uh, it was around 1,000 people. And in India, uh, this was thousands of people across multiple villages, and each village, uh, everyone in that village got the basic income. There was the Finland's pilot uh, from, it was a two-year pilot, 2017, 2018. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there about that pilot, uh, but actually besides uh, trust being one of those things that went up. Um, employment actually did slightly go up in Finland's pilot. A lot of people think that it somehow went down or was somehow canceled early, and that's not true. That's uh, misinformation that's out there. Then uh, Give Directly has been doing a 12-year uh, EBI pilot in Kenya. Uh, that's been going on since 2016. Uh, they actually just released their first report um, of their first couple years um, 
just recently. And so there's seven years in the pilot, but uh, that first report just came out. Really interesting, uh, the results from that too. And um, the uh, this was a, a natural experiment, uh, has been happening since 1997. Uh, that was with the, um, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians started up casino dividends in North Carolina there in 1997. And uh, those casino dividends have grown over time. And uh, at this point, it's around over $12,000 per year. Uh, but since 1997, when it first started, uh, I believe it started somewhere around $4,000 per year and has gone up since. Um, but that's universal um, within that, within the Eastern Band. And uh, what's so fascinating about that one, too, is that a, uh, a the Smoky Mountain set of youth was already going on at the time. They were studying a group of uh, children living in poverty there in North Carolina. And then suddenly, uh, within that group, they're already studying uh, a bunch of them. Their parents started receiving these dividends. So it really created a, a fascinating natural experiment that uh, that researchers are able to follow in a longitudinal way over time. And so there's still studies looking at that to see just the impacts that that had on these kids now that they're even like, uh, you know, in their 30s. Then uh, Iran started up the uh, fuel subsidy reform cash grant in 2011. And it went to uh, at least 2016. It's kind of confusing uh, what what happened here, but it's uh, it was never meant to be a UBI. Uh, what they wanted to do is they wanted to convert their oil subsidies into a cash grant. So instead of making oil cheaper, uh, oil would be more expensive, but instead people would get money to afford uh, to purchase that oil and also you know, purchase the food and stuff, um, which would otherwise be cheaper with oil subsidies. And when they first started that, about half of, uh, of Iran started receiving these, but everyone was able to do it. Uh, so it actually went up to 96% of the population uh, signed up to receive this cash grant. And it was just, you know, very popular. And um, uh, there's been some adjustments since then. They wanted to, they felt there was too many people who were getting it. So they reduced that number. Uh, so, but it was like a very small window of time where it was like a full on kind of universal basic income. Um, but there was a study uh, done of that. And again, it results in the, the usual stuff is in, you know, no decrease in employment and, um, increases in uh, self-employment and, uh, especially among women. Then there's, uh, Ben Macau's wealth partaking scheme. That's, uh, an annual dividend, uh, since 2008. And more recently, uh, Starting in Stockton, California, as far as the city pilots uh, went that were organized by um, former, maker, former mayor Michael Tubbs and the uh, Mayor's for Guaranteed Income uh, that inspired these pilots. Uh, this is well over 100, actually more than 150 now. Um, they've been going on since 2018, and a lot more pilots have been going on since 2020 that uh, got a lot of funding from the uh, American Rescue Plan. So there's just all kinds of cities around the around the US that are uh, that are testing th the provision of um, cash without work requirements um, to various uh, demographics in areas. Then there was uh, in South Korea, they did a youth dividend where uh, everyone uh, upon reaching the age of 25, I believe it was, uh, received a um, monthly uh, dividend uh, for that year. And uh, that was launched in 2016. And in fact, it was 
so popular. It was uh, the province it was launched in. Uh, the governor of that province went on to run for president and he almost won. So in South Korea, um, they were very, very close to a presidential candidate who actually had run on basic income as part of his, his platform and uh, just lost by um, you know less than 1%. Uh, then there have just been many, many studies uh, around the world of um, monthly child allowances. Uh, Canada has the Canadian Child Benefit. There's a lot to learn from this uh, provision. It's either can be universal to all children, um, or it's mostly universal. Uh, but either way, there's no work requirements usually attached to these uh, child benefits. And so there's a lot to learn uh, from what happens when uh, that money is provided to families and macroeconomically speaking, what happens at the, at the larger level. And um, one of the things that Canada's child benefit has showed is uh, that each dollar spent uh, on that benefit actually grows the economy by $2. And that's kind of actually a, a frequent result too, just in general, is uh, that's usually about $1 per $2 when it comes to uh, the multiplier effect of unconditional cash. And there's just been lots of studies in general of conditional and unconditional cash transfers uh, around the world. Uh, cash transfers have been something increasingly popular and unconditional cash transfers have even been more recently uh, increasingly popular. And so there's just a lot to learn from those studies. And then more recently, there was a whole lot of uh, cash programs that were the result of, uh, uh, that were the result of the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And so more recently, there's been studies of uh, what happened from those uh, cash payments. And also there's just uh, stuff to learn from uh, lottery payments, uh, especially any kind of lottery payment where someone wins like a monthly payment for life uh, instead of like a very, very large win. Uh, you know, where someone would get a huge windfall and said, you know, what happens when someone wins 2000 or 4000 or something dollars per month for life? Um, it's very interesting to, to look at like the results of those smaller lottery wins. So more recently, there have uh, been, again, many of these 150 plus pilots that are uh, currently going on or recently finished. And here's just some of them that I uh, wanted to highlight here. Uh, in Durham, North Carolina, this pilot's focused on uh, the formerly incarcerated. And so those who were recently in prison were provided $600 per month. And um, this is the one that we saw a 0% recidivism rate in, uh, for the one year. And uh, yeah, so here's the expectations. Uh, as well as, it's more than a third, it's 44% is the one year expectation uh, for recidivism. And 67% uh, 67, 67 for three years and 76% for five years. So it's kind of insane that like the average rate about um, four out of five people who leave prison are expected to uh, return to prison within five years. And just imagine how expensive that is. You know, if we're spending $60,000 to uh, cover the cost of someone being in prison, and uh, also considering the, the, the loss of, uh, you know, overall productivity from someone, you know, being in prison instead of like having a job, then just extremely expensive um, if an amount of even $600 per month actually reduces the recidivism rate by that much. And it's important to, really important to consider just how much savings that uh, basic income would have. And the uh, 
in Denver, something exciting too, this is the pilot focused on uh, people experiencing homelessness. And this pilot is designed with uh, their testing. Uh, besides the control group, that's provided uh, $50 a month to just be part of the control group and do surveys. Um, there's a group that's receiving $1,000 per month. And there's also a group that's receiving $500 per month after um, an initial $6,500 um, one-time payment uh, right at the beginning. And as a result, this is just the, the halfway result after six months. Uh, zero out of 154 people in the $1,000 per month group uh, reported still sleeping outside at that point. And the control group, it was 4%. Uh, so there have been multiple studies of uh, looking at the effect of basic income and even just unconditional cash on uh, those experiencing homelessness. And there's just a lot of savings to be had there. In the uh, Vancouver Leaf Pilot that provided $7,500 uh, to people experiencing homelessness, uh, it was observed that they actually saved $8,100 on reduced shelter costs. So that actually saved more money than it cost uh, to just provide people uh, the money instead of putting that money into shelters to house people. So that's also something to consider just, again, how expensive that is to uh, go about the problem of homelessness and uh, how much more affordable it would be just to make sure that people had an income, uh, both to escape homelessness, but also uh, avoid ever falling into homelessness entirely. Uh, another more recent pilot was in St. Paul, Minnesota, and they were focusing on the parents of infants, and the amount was $500 per month uh, for one and a half years. And uh, interesting, interestingly, that they found a heightened sense of feeling of feeling valued by others and reduced social isolation. Again, this is uh, kind of a common finding, too, is that uh, there's a a reduced sense of, of uh, an increased sense of community and that just people feel uh, like they're more part of something, more connected to other people. Uh, it really increases social cohesion. And uh, just because people can feel so isolated and that isolation can lead to uh, depression and uh reduced mental health, that just if this, if just one impact of basic income is that it kind of grows the sense of community and, and uh, enables people to feel more connected to each other. And, you know, you're able to spend more time with friends and family and members of your community. Um, that itself has a lot of positive impacts. And another more recent pilot uh, was in Austin, Texas. And the focus there were people experiencing uh, um, unstable housing and had low income. And the amount was $1,000 per month. And again, people felt significantly more connected to people and places in their neighborhoods. So like, again, just what, what does that mean to actually feel like you're more uh, part of your actual community? And if more people actually, uh, engaged in their community, volunteered, uh, took part in, in just being a part of their community. So with, with all that said, uh, again, I know the, the biggest concern, uh, tends to be that, that people will, oh, they'll, they'll work less, they'll stop working, they'll get lazy. And, uh, Again, that's just not found. So this is the, the report of the systematic review, and this is the actual um, language from, from the study. And uh, so it says, despite a detailed search, we have not found any evidence of a significant reduction in labor supply. Instead, we found evidence that labor supply increases globally among adults, men and women, young and old, and the existence of some 
insignificant and functional reductions to the system, such as a decrease in workers from the following categories, children, the elderly, the sick, those with disabilities, women with young children to look after, or young people who continued studying. These reductions do not reduce overall supply because it is largely offset by increased supply from other members of the community. So this is just something that is found over and over again, that if there are reductions in work, it's from those specific categories. And because of the fact that the amount is, is universal, so this is especially true in saturation pilots where, entirely, where entire communities, uh, entire villages, uh, cities, states, uh, countries, even with these larger universal programs that aren't basic income, uh, but still, if it's a, a, if a program is large enough, providing enough cash, then more people have money to spend, and then that creates demand, creates new jobs, and then people um, without jobs are able to find those new jobs. And so then even if some people work less because they're uh, young people studying or, or women who just had kids or those with disabilities, then that is entirely offset usually by people who were unemployed or actually able to find work, uh, or even just people who weren't in work, who uh, weren't technically unemployed, uh, who decided that suddenly that was, uh, you know, they wanted to, to work. And there's, there's something else I want everyone to consider, which is uh, the impact of loss of of trust and so just want to read this quote here uh, uh, about this income inequality and trust inequality are inextricably linked in a moment of dangerous embrace a problem for all of planet earth in 2024 we found double digit income based trust inequality in 23 of the 28 countries in which we study these trends that's up from 21 countries 12 months ago Globally, less than half of people with low incomes trust their own electoral system, 49%, and feel that their current government was fairly elected and is legitimate, 49%. That compares to nearly two-thirds of people with high incomes, which is 64% at both. So just consider with this default of trust, of distrust, where people don't trust each other and... Uh, just what is the impact of that? Uh, you know, if if countries start losing trust to the point where, say, democracy falls and and authoritarianism rises, like how do you calculate that cost? Like, what is the cost of of that loss of trust? And there's something else. Uh, a lot of people talk about impacts of automation on work, and uh, I just want everyone to consider the impact of automation on democracy itself. Here's a report, a uh, study looking into this, found that, quote, we investigate the impact of industrial robot adoption on individual voting behavior in 13 Western European countries between 1999 and 2015. We find that individuals more exposed to automation tend to display higher support for the radical right. Automation was also associated with poorer perceived economic conditions, lower likelihood of having a permanent contract, and lower satisfaction with the government and democracy. I would also like to add here that they did also find higher support for the radical left as well, but it wasn't quite as large as it was for the radical right. Uh, but taking that into consideration, this is the impact is polarizing. You're, it, it just the impact of automation and uh, even just you know, not necessarily having lost your job, but fearing that you will lose your job, uh, appears to be a radicalizing force. And uh, there's when it comes to this loss of trust, uh, I think this explains part of it. So this is a study that looked at um, a um, at cash assistance and uh, how it was done. And, and found this. Uh, among those who barely met the cutoff to be cash transfer recipients, 
the relative poverty prime led to a 0.6 percentage point increase in government satisfaction. Among those who barely missed the cutoff and received no cash transfer assistance, we observe a 10.5 percentage point drop in government confidence. Non-beneficiaries feel resentment that they do not have access to economic assistance from the state that others have access to, despite their economic need. So to simplify this, uh, basically, when you draw an arbitrary line and you have this means-tested kind of conditional benefit where those to one side of the line get the uh, cash assistance and those on the other side of the line don't, then the result is that people who get it, uh, their satisfaction with uh, government, say, increases by a point. Uh, but then if you're on the other side of that line and you don't get it, then government dissatisfaction um, drops by 10 points. So it's, it's like a, it's a huge difference. It's, 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 um, you know, it's not so much that the problem is that, that you're helping people. The problem is that you're not helping people who actually really do need the help. And that has a huge impact on the way people feel about their governments to actually be on the other side of that line. So I think that really points towards the importance of universality. You don't want anyone to be on the side of the line where they uh, begin to massively distrust um, and lose confidence in their government and democracy. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Finland's pilot showed an impact in trust. So this is from the uh, from the report. At the end of the two years, basic income recipients registered elevated levels of trust in other people and, and institutions, uh, such as Finland's politicians, political parties, parliament, judiciary, and social security system. One explanation could be that the basic income experiment did not involve bureaucracy. Another, that the recipients felt society or the system was not neglecting people who had fallen on hard times. So this supports the hypothesis from the previous side that if you make sure and not ex you make sure to not exclude people, um, then they will be happier with uh, the government, of course. And also, bureaucracy itself means that you exclude a lot of people and. Um, and bureaucracy itself also means that you can piss off a lot of people um, uh, who are actually receiving it, the, the assistance, just the, the, the meat grinder that you feed people through uh, in the attempt to help them can actually really turn them against bureaucracy and, of course, the government as a whole for just distrusting them and, and treating them um, so paternalistically. Um, as so many of these programs tend to do. So all in all, considering all of this, what is the ultimate net cost of UBI? So again, mathematically speaking, or to calculate the net cost of UBI, you have to ask, uh, besides uh, the difference between the uh, basic income provided and the taxes paired with it, um, what programs and subsidies can be replaced and reformed? So, you know, there's certainly welfare programs can be replaced by a basic income, uh, but there's also many tax expenditures that could be replaced by basic income. Uh, and here in the US, uh, like everyone gets the standard deduction. Uh, the point of that is that you don't want to tax people until they're about out of poverty. Uh, so you get that standard deduction that you um, subtract from the income that you earned, and then you pay taxes on the remainder of the income minus the uh, standard deduction. And so with the basic income, you could just eliminate the standard deduction, in which case that would be the elimination of a large tax expenditure. And so uh, the cost isn't as, as much as people would think if that's a reform uh, that is included. 
And then there's lots of other uh, tax subsidies that are provided as well. On average, in the U.S., it's about uh, $1.5 trillion per year total in uh, total tax expenditures. And also considering the cost, uh, what services will be less burdened? Again, because we find that people get healthier and that recidivism goes down, that people commit less, fewer crimes, um, what are the the reductions of cost that is the uh, result of that? You know, if we're spending, uh, you know, if the calculation is, say, a uh, trillion dollars per year, um, as it has been found on the downstream costs of child poverty, uh, and we eliminate child poverty, then we wouldn't have those downstream costs anymore. So if altogether, uh, you know, if the cost of uh, not having a basic income in the form of more crime, worse health, lower productivity is $3 trillion per year, then any net cost below $3 trillion per year is uh, saving more um, than we're actually already spending. Then another thing to consider is just how much larger the economy will grow um, when you actually have more consumer spending power and greater consumer confidence. Like if um, more people are able to start up businesses, again, as the results tend to show with greater entre entrepreneurship rates, and more people are able to uh, purchase goods and services from those new businesses and from existing small businesses, um, then GDP will grow at a faster rate. And so if, uh, if you're looking at the cost, then you need to consider that, uh, that the entire economy would grow. And so the cost itself would be uh, a smaller percentage uh, compared to what it is now in a uh, smaller uh, overall economy. And then, of course, uh, thinking about trust and just democracy itself, you know, what is the cost of the loss of faith in democracy? Uh, if if a country decides to uh, become uh, a dictatorship and they'll vote for an authoritarian or a totalitarian, then what is the cost of that? Uh, you know, economically speaking, you can say nothing really happened, uh, but it will have economic impacts and it will have many other impacts uh, beyond economic impacts. So how do you how do you how do you put a price on that? Then there's another thing to consider, which is uh, David Graeber's uh, bullshit jobs argument. I recommend reading that book, um, but his uh, hypothesis was that there's some percentage, some significant percentage of jobs uh, being done are entirely unnecessary. You know, people are a lot of people are doing these jobs just because they need the money. Uh, there's uh, essentially just it's the job exists as an excuse to pay people or um, it's in those jobs exist for other reasons. Um, but it's the kind of job where uh, the person doing it feels that there's absolutely no point in doing it. And that if you were to eliminate that job, it would really do nothing. You know, society would just continue on and no one would really knows anything. Uh, but these jobs exist anyways. So that is a cost. There, it, there's so much work being done that is entirely unnecessary. And there's so much work being that needs to be done that isn't being done. So if we were able to uh, get rid of those unnecessary jobs, thanks to people gaining the ability to refuse to do them, and instead do a job that needs to be done, then uh, the entire economy would be more efficient and uh, we would just get so much more stuff done that needs to be done. And aside from these unnecessary jobs, there's harmful jobs going on. Now, this is socially harmful jobs and um, uh, environmentally destructive jobs. Uh, as an example of, uh, of this, there was a, 
a study of an unconditional cash transfer program where um, the village uh, that received this, they actually, uh, there was a, a 30, 30% decrease in deforestation as a result of it. So the cash had nothing to do with, um, you know, some condition to not cut down trees. Um, but because people actually were lifted out of poverty, then they didn't need to cut down trees for money. And so they're able to do other things. And, um, instead of, of, um, this eco-destructive kind of job. So just imagine how many jobs out there uh, exist in a way that's actually, you know, harming and, uh, you know, contributing to uh, climate change. And what if we were able to shift away from those kind of jobs? And another thing to consider when it comes to the, to the net cost of EBI is, do we actually have the economic capacity to meet demand for basic needs? So this is this kind of gets at just um, the the reality of money itself, where um, government is able to, as a currency issuer, just spend the money, and taxes then are used to um, pull that money out of the um, money supply. And so the order of events is actually uh, government spending first, which creates the money, and then taxes actually help manage inflation. And inflation being something that is observed when demand exceeds uh, supply. So when it comes to a basic income, if you, if you uh, spend, if the government spends a, um, a a basic amount of money for basic goods and services, and uh, there is sufficient supply to meet all of that, then there should be no uh, inflation for those basic needs as long as uh, demand doesn't exceed supply. So that's a real question too, uh, beyond taxes even, is how do you go about making sure that uh, economic capacity is sufficient for meeting supply. There's a lot of other ways to do that other than managing um, the amount of money uh, in the money supply. Um, one example of, of, uh, of something that is another way of uh, increasing like supply is if you imagine like uh, housing. So, uh, a land value tax is a it would be a great way to pull money out of the money supply uh, to help manage inflation, but then it would also have the added impact of um, encouraging development uh, of of land to actually you know have housing. So you know it would right now you can sit on a, an empty vacant lot and just wait for the value to rise and then sell it later for a big windfall once everything around it has uh, has grown up in value. And uh, with a land value tax, then sitting on a vacant piece of land would actually be very costly. So you would have to uh, sell that land or develop it so that you could pay the land value tax. And uh, so one of the ways, one of the things that would encourage is, um, you know, more housing, which would increase the supply of housing and therefore help push down the cost of rent. Uh, that's a tax that would help with that. But then if you just do something like EMB reforms, then, uh, you know, if you uh, make a reform where uh, currently there can only be single family homes, uh, and you instead uh, get rid of that regulation and say, no, there can be multifamily homes, then suddenly there can be greater supply of this housing, which would reduce uh, the cost of housing. And housing is such a, in a factor in measurements of inflation. So you wouldn't necessarily have to tax more uh, to receive uh, reduced inflation in the housing sector, 
if you just made sure and had policies that enabled uh, the creation of more housing. And so it's important to actually take a, a, a larger look at the economy uh, aside from just thinking of, do we have enough money to do something? Money is not the limit. Uh, the limit is uh, actual resources and technology and people and skills and uh, a way of measuring if you're if you have a sufficient amount of all those things is inflation if uh, if your inflation rate is exceeding your target rate then you should make adjustments uh, to bring that inflation back down there's lots of ways to do that besides taxing So when people ask, do we have enough money for UBI's net cost? I think that's the wrong question. Um, money is like ballots. It's a voting tool. You know, this is who, what is, what is it, what's important for an economy to produce? Um, if you have a huge segment of the population that is unable to essentially vote on what should be produced and, um, you know, what kind and where and and all of that, uh, thanks to being able to buy stuff in stores, then the economy is uh, is insufficiently, uh, you know, meaning than the actual demands that people have. It's distorted. It's meeting the demands of just mostly those with the most amount of money, where money is concentrated. And so you have an economy that's built to meet the needs of, of rich people and those with more money. And it's kind of ignoring the needs of everybody else. So it's really important for market economies to make sure that every single person within that market economy actually has the money to vote on uh, what that market economy should be producing. Uh, again, inflation is the ultimate constraint. It's uh, don't get caught up in just the cost of this stuff. Um, consider everything uh, that would lead to inflation and how to manage that um, after just making sure that the money for basic income is spent um, and then just making sure that uh, that the amount isn't too high and that the taxes are sufficient, the taxes are uh, proper design, and that there's a lot of other policies uh, to make sure that there's sufficient economic capacity. Uh, yeah, the question is, uh, can consumer demand be met when it comes to basics, the basic needs of life like food and shelter and clothing, electricity, um, these things, there's plenty of that in the U.S. Um, and if there isn't, you know, if, if, uh, if there wasn't enough ability to meet that supply, then clearly we're not doing something right and we should make sure that there is enough. And the best way to do that is to make sure there's sufficient demand expressed for those basics. Basic income will make sure that, uh, that there is sufficient basic goods and services for all. And yeah, you know, do we have the resources, knowledge and technology to meet the demand? Uh, and also if, even if there is uh, like a temporary spike in inflation, like uh, if legitimately demand exceeds supply uh, because there just isn't enough capacity for supply, then that can be an entirely temporary phenomenon. Um, you know, that's, that's the way supply and demand works, where if the price of something goes up um, because of some kind of shortage, then suppliers see that increase in price and want to um, to profit from that. And so then they'll invest in uh, greater supply. They want to make sure that um, they are able to, to meet that market demand. And so over time, uh, once those investments are made and then supply goes up, then that price will go back down. So keep that in mind as well, that... Uh, inflation, any inflation can always be just uh, temporary. And in fact, can lead to lower prices. That's even something that has been observed uh, too, like in the India UBI pilots. Um, 
that was something that was that was seen when uh, what happened was there was more demand for like fresh fruits and vegetables and uh, suppliers saw that and greatly increased the supply. And so uh, the, the cost of those actually went down dramatically. Uh, they didn't go up. It's the opposite because um, there now that the demand existed, then suppliers were able to um, just invest in, in more of that and uh, enjoy that. And like in another example, just to think about how markets respond to increases in uh in demand like imagine if uh you know if eggs were really expensive and uh people suddenly got money through basic income uh people may assume that oh uh you know the price of eggs will even go up because the demand for eggs will be even higher and uh but instead people actually use those eggs uh people use those money to buy chickens and then chickens uh, to lay their own eggs. And suddenly there's like a magnitude, an order of magnitude more eggs, and then the price of eggs would plummet uh, because of that. So it's, it's, not, uh, it's not good to just assume uh, that supply is static. Uh, supply always adjusts to demand. And then also, of course, uh, it's important that competition exists uh, to keep prices low. If there's lack of competition, if there's monopoly, then uh, you can see price hikes, just like we have seen as a result of the pandemic and the seller's inflation. You know, the, uh, the, because supply uh, was, uh, as a result of the pandemic, unable to meet demand, then we saw inflation. And then uh, producers, especially uh, in a uh, concentrated markets, were able to just increase prices way beyond what they needed to uh, to experience record profits. And so the problem there was just lack of cons uh, lack of competition due to this uh, uh, reduced competition. So again, when it comes to managing inflation. Uh, another non-tax way of managing inflation is investing and in making sure that um, that there's sufficient competition. So, yeah, with that, thank you for uh, listening and watching this uh, this presentation about basic income. Uh, you can read more. Uh, you can find my website, scottsantons.com. I've got a UBI FEQ there. Uh, you can read my book, Let There Be Money. Uh, I'm on social media everywhere at, at social at Scott Santons. And uh, you can email me at scott at scottsantons.com. Thank you.